And we are live. Good afternoon. Welcome to this public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Before we start, can I confirm that all the commissioners are here? Commissioner Feldman? Present, thank you. Commissioner Trumka? May need to unmute. Commissioner Trumka? Uh, Commissioner Trumka, I think you were just muted, so I see you. And Commissioner Boyle. I'm here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So seeing all the commissioners, uh, today CPSC staff will, be brief, will brief the commission on a draft final rule to establish a consumer product safety standard for clothing storage units, or CSUs. This draft final rule is intended to address risk of injury or death associated with CSU tip-overs, particularly involving children. Between January 2000 and April 2022, CPSC identified 199 CSU tip-over fatalities involving children. With most reported CSU tip-over deaths involving children three years and younger, this hazard pattern affects our most vulnerable population, primary care young children. Almost five years ago, in November 2017, the Commission began the process of considering a mandatory safety standard for CSUs when it published an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. In February of this year, we issued a notice of proposed rulemaking that requ would require CSUs to be tested for stability, be marked and labeled with safety information, and bear a hang tag, hang tag providing data about the stability of the union. Significant staff time and resources have gone into the 600 page briefing package that's currently before the commission. And today, the CPSC staff will brief us on their draft final rule, including the modifications they recommended in response to the public comments received during the notice proposed rulemaking. Uh, when it was up for comment. In a moment, I'll turn this meeting over to staff so that they can brief us. Once they've completed the briefing, each commissioner will have 10 minutes to ask questions of staff with multiple rounds if necessary. As a reminder, if you have any questions that address the agency's legal authority, please hold them until a closed executive session has been requested to be held following this public briefing. Briefing us today are Kristen Talcott, Project Manager, Division of Human Factors, Directed for Engineering Sciences, Meredith Kelsch, Attorney, Regulatory Affairs Division, OGC. Also joining our Dwayne Boniface, Assistant Executive Director, Office of Hazard Analysis and Reduction. Alice, excuse me, Alex uh, Moscoso, uh, Exec Associate Executive Director, Director for Economic Analysis. Jason Levine, CPSC Executive Director, Austin Schlick, General Counsel, and Alberta Mills, Commission Secretary. With that, I will now turn to Dr. Talcott and Ms. Kelsch for their briefing. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Kristen Talcott, and I'm the lead for the Clothing Storage Unit Took Over Project. Today, the project attorney, Meredith Kelsch, and I will be briefing on the draft final rule for Clothing Storage Unit. Meredith will start by covering the legal framework, and then I will provide an overview of the draft final rule and supporting analysis. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Meredith Kelsch. I'm an attorney with the Regulatory Affairs Division in the Office of the General Counsel. Uh, starting with slide two, please. I will be giving a brief overview of the statutory framework for issuing a standard under the Consumer Product Safety Act. This rulemaking falls under section, section seven and nine and section 27E of the CPSA. Section seven and nine apply to the performance requirements regarding stability and the labeling requirements. And section 27E applies to the hang tag requirements. Next slide. Section 7 and 9 of the CPSA set out requirements for the Commission to issue a consumer product safety standard. Section 7 of the CPSA authorizes the Commission to issue consumer product safety standards that consist of performance requirements or requirements regarding warnings or instructions. Any requirements must be reasonably necessary to prevent or reduce an unreasonable risk of injury associated with the product. Section 7 of the CPSA also specifies that consumer product safety standards 
must be issued in accordance with the requirements in Section 9 of the statute. Next slide. Section 9 of the CPSA provides procedural and substantive requirements for issuing a consumer product safety standard. Under Section 9, a final rule must comply with Section 553 of the Administrative Procedure Act, which requires agencies to give interested parties notice of a proposed rule and the opportunity to comment on it. It also requires that the rule include a final regulatory analysis and that it includes certain findings that the Commission must make to issue the final rule. Next slide. As I mentioned, one requirement, required component of a final rule is a final regulatory analysis. Section 9 of the CPSA provides specific elements that must be included in a final regulatory analysis. It must discuss potential benefits and costs of the rule and who is likely to receive and bear them, alternatives the Commission considered, their potential benefits and costs, and reasons they were not chosen, and significant issues raised by commenters on the preliminary regulatory analysis, which is published with the proposed rule, and a summary assessment of those issues. In addition to supporting the final regulatory analysis, information about costs and benefits associated with the rule helps form the basis for several of the required findings for a final rule. Next slide. As I mentioned, to issue a final rule, the Commission must consider and make specific findings, and those findings must be included in the rule. This slide shows eight of the nine required findings. Next slide, please. The final finding deals with voluntary standards. If a voluntary standard that addresses the risk of injury at issue has been adopted and implemented, the Commission must find that either compliance with the voluntary standard is not likely to adequately reduce the risk of injury, or it is unlikely that there will be substantial compliance with the voluntary standard. Next slide. The hang tag requirement in the final rule falls under Section 27E of the CPSA. Under Section 27E, the Commission may issue a rule to require manufacturers of consumer products to provide performance and technical data related to performance and safety to purchasers at the time of original purchase when necessary to carry out the purposes of the CPSA. Section 2 of the CPSA states the purposes of the statute, which include protecting the public against unreasonable risks of injury associated with consumer products and assisting consumers in evaluating the comparative safety of consumer products. I will now turn it over to Kristen, who will provide further information about the briefing package and the draft final rule. Thank you, Meredith. Now I will present the findings. Oh, sorry. Next slide, please. Now I will present the findings in the staff briefing package. This draft final rule addresses the risk, particularly to children, associated with clothing storage units, abbreviated CFUs, tipping over. Analysis presented in the NPR and affirmed in this package shows the factors leading to tip over include multiple open and filled drawers, placement of a CFU on carpet, and a child's interaction with the CFU, for example, by climbing and pulling. The existing voluntary standards do not adequately address the risk. The draft final rule includes CFU utility requirements that account for all of the factors leading to a tip over, and a single test that includes all extendable elements, which are drawers and pull-out shelves, and doors open, a clothing representative fill, CFU tilted forward to simulate the effect of carpet, and forces from a child climbing or pulling on the CSU. The draft final rule also requires safety and identification information labeling and technical information on CSU stability at the point of sale through a hang tag. Next slide, please. To address the hazards associated with CSU tip overs, the Commission has taken several steps, including the anchor campaign, 43 recalls to address CSU tip over hazards a briefing package looking at compliance with and adequacy of the voluntary standards, an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, or ANPR, and a notice of proposed rulemaking, or NPR. The Commission is now considering a final rule, which is the subject of this briefing. Next slide, please. This slide shows the definition of CFU in the draft final rule. Common names for CFUs include chests, bureaus, dressers, armoires, and wardrobes. This definition differs somewhat from that in the NPR. Most notably, the draft final rule definition only includes units with a mass or total combined weight greater than or equal to 57 pounds and all of the extensible elements are filled with the clothing representative load. 
This change is based on staff response to public comments, which I will discuss in more detail in upcoming slides. Next slide, please. This slide includes pictures of some products that fall within the scope of the draft final rule. As you can see, the scope includes units with a variety of designs. Next slide, please. As in the NPR, staff recommends excluding closed lockers and portable storage closets from the draft final rule because of lack of incidents associated with these products. Next slide, please. Staff updated the market information in the draft final rule to reflect information provided by commenters and to provide a more accurate representation of revenue, average prices, and unit sales as of the end of 2021. Changes include an updated average CSU price led to a reduction in the number of units sold and in use. Next slide, please. The draft final rule includes analysis of new data received since the time frame analyzed in the NPR. Staff is aware of a total of 234 fatalities caused by CSU tipover instability from 2000 through April 2022. Eight of these fatalities, including six child fatalities, were reported since the NPR. Most fatalities involve children one, two, or three years old. Next slide, please. Staff also analyzed reported non-fatal CSU tipover incidents from the Consumer Product Safety Risk Management System, abbreviated CPS RMS. In this time period, staff is aware of 1,154 CSU tipover instability incidents, including 743 injuries. This includes 152 additional incidents and 91 additional injuries beyond those reported in the NPR. Staff also analyzed data from the National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, abbreviated NICE. Staff estimate an average of 5,300 injuries per year. 72% of these were injuries to children. Overall, the new data reported in this briefing package are consistent with those reported in the NPR. Next slide, please. The injuries caused by CSC tipover include soft tissue and skeletal injuries, bone fracture, skull fracture, closed head injuries, compressional and mechanical asphyxia, and internal organ crushing leading to hemorrhage. Overall, the injury analysis in the draft final rule is consistent with that in the NPR. Next slide, please. As with the NPR, staff focused on incidents involving children and CSUs without television. This is because children are most at risk and because CSU incidents involving televisions appear to be decreasing. The main hazards associated with CSU tip-over are multiple open drawers and doors, drawer fill, placement of the CSU on carpet, and children's interaction with the CSU. These are the same as those reported in the NPR. Incidents all can involve a combination of these factors. For example, in one of the non-fatal incidents, a three-year-old child climbed on the CSU with all seven drawers open and filled, and the CSU was on carpet. Next slide, please. This slide shows some examples of children's interactions with CSUs from online videos. The videos show a variety of climbing techniques. They also show children pulling on drawers and opening multiple drawers. Next slide, please. Open and filled drawers are important because they can shift the CSU's center of gravity forward, making it less stable. In the draft final rule, staff uses the same approximation of the weight of clothing fill as in the NPR, which is 8.5 pounds per cubic foot of functional volume. In the NPR, staff provided analysis of the clothing fill weight in the drawer. In response to comments, staff conducted follow-up testing for the draft final rule that confirms this is a reasonable fill weight for pull-out shelves as well. Next slide, please. Carpet is also an important factor because it can, consider, can considerably decrease the weight at which a CSU tips. As testing and analysis in the NPR shows, tilting the CSU forward can replicate the effect of carpet on stability. Next slide, please. On the right of this slide is a free body diagram showing the forces on a CSU from the child's interaction. The horizontal and vertical forces create rotational force called a moment that acts about a pivot point, also called a fulcrum. In the CSU, the fulcrum is generally the front leg. The moment is created by forces acting at a distance, also called a moment arm, away from the fulcrum. For horizontal forces, the moment arm is the vertical distance to the fulcrum. And for vertical forces, the moment arm is the horizontal distance to the 
fulcrum. Applying the same force with a longer moment arm will create a larger moment, making it easier to cause rotation. Next slide, please. Research and analysis in the NPR showed that children stepping onto a CSU decline create moments that are over 1.6 times those from body weight alone for an average for extension. The moment is a result of the dynamic interaction with the CSU, including horizontal forces that allow the child to extend their center of gravity away from the CSU. This means that recreating the force of a 51.2 pound, 95th percentile three year old climbing, which is the weight that's used in the NPR and draft final rule, would require over 80 pounds of weight on an average extension for a front. Next slide, please. With regards to pulling on the CSU, the mean pull strength for two to five-year-old children is 17.2 pounds, and the 95th percentile overhead reach for three-year-old children is 4.12 feet. Overall, staff analysis of the climbing and pull forces for the draft final rule are unchanged from those in the NPR. Next slide, please. The primary voluntary standard that addresses CSUs is ASTM S 2057. The current version of the standards was published in 2019. ASTM S 2057-19 has two stability requirements. The first requires the unit not tip over when all extension elements are open and no additional force is applied. The second requires that the unit not tip over when a 50-pound test weight is applied to a single open extension element. Both of the tests are conducted on a flat surface and with extendable elements empty. Next slide, please. For the NPR briefing package, staff tested a market sample of over 180 PSUs and found the majority met the ASTM S2057 stability requirements. Staff's assessment of compliance for the draft final rule is the same as that in the NPR. However, as in the NPR, staff concludes that the stability requirements in ASTM S2057-19 are not adequate to address the CSU tip over hazards because they do not account for multiple open and filled drawers carpeted flooring, and forces generated by children's dynamic interactions with the CSU. In addition, staff is aware of fatal and non-fatal incidents involving CSUs that meet the ASTM S2057-19 stability requirements. In the update analysis for the draft final rule with the new incident data, staff found more than two times the number of incidents of CSUs that met the ASTM S2057-19 stability requirements than incidents with those that did not. Next slide, please. In November 2021, ASTM started a discussion of possible changes to the voluntary standards. The valid changes include adding a fill weight to the extendable elements in the first test. The test would still be conducted on a flat level surface, no forces from children's interactions. Increasing the 50 pound test weight to 60 pounds, angling the unit to simulate the effective carpet, and opening all extendable elements and doors in the second test. The extendable elements would still not have a fill weight for this test and adding a third test with a 10 pound outward horizontal force and all extendable elements and doors open. This test should be conducted on a flat level surface and extendable elements did not have a fill weight. ASTM has not yet published a new version of the F2057 standards and staff does not know if, when, or in what form any updated standards will be published. Next slide, please. Furthermore, Staff assessed that the validated changes, if enacted, would not adequately address the tip over hazards because they failed to address real world conditions, which is multiple factors at once, and they failed to apply an adequate tip moment to account for a child climbing or pulling on a CSU. Next slide, please. Staff also looked at three additional CSU related voluntary standards and an additional standard with requirements for interlock systems. As in the NPR, staff says that these standards are also inadequate to address the tip over hazards. Next slide, please. Based on staff analysis and public comment, staff recommended changes in several areas of the draft proposed rule. I'll briefly describe the changes to the requirements. The full analysis of comments and recommended changes are in the briefing package. Next slide, please. For the scope and definition, the biggest change is to modify the definition of CSU to include only units that weigh 57 pounds or more when all extendable elements are filled with the floating representative load. This change stresses comments that lighter weight CSU should be excluded from the rule while accounting for real-world CSU use, which includes a unit filled with clothing. 
and the hazard presented by the total weight of the CSU with that closing, as opposed to an empty CSU. The value is based on the lightest known total weight of a non-modified CSU in a fatal tip-over incident. Additional changes to the scope and definitions are listed on the slide. Next slide, please. For the test method, to address comments regarding the repeatability and reproducibility of the stability test, the draft final rule now includes, now specifies which test method to use for a CSU without overlap between test methods. Test method one was also revised to specify that the force is to be applied using weight instead of leaving the method up to the tester. In response to comments recommended an easier method of simulating the effective carpet, the 1.5 degree forward tilt angle was replaced by a 0.43 inch thick test block at the rear of the CSU. This test block also simulates the effect of carpet and the range of angles discussed in the NPR. Additional changes to the test method are listed on the slide. Next slide, please. For the requirements for marking and labeling, to increase warning label comprehension, the child climbing symbol was replaced with a three panel child climbing symbol from the CPSC contractor report discussed in the NPR. Additional changes to the marking and labeling requirements are listed on the slide. For the hang tag, the scale was narrowed from a maximum of five to a maximum of two. This is based on comments regarding the modifications needed to products currently on the market to reach a rating of one, and the low likelihood that products will exceed a rating of two in the near term. To address comments on consumers' ability to review stability ratings at the time of online purchase, the requirements now require the hang tag information to be displayed on the manufacturer's online sales interfaces, for example, websites or apps. An additional change to the hang tag is also listed on the slide. Draft final rule requirements also include editorial changes that will improve readability, fix typographical errors, and remove redundant language. In addition to the changes to the requirements, staff also recommends an effective date of 180 days. This is based on comments expressing concern that the 30-day effective date proposed in the NPR due to long lead times for redesigning, testing, manufacturing, and delivering compliant CSUs to consumers. Next slide, please. The stability requirements in the draft final rule account for multiple open and filled drawers and carpets through the test configuration, or how the CSU is set for testing. The CSU is tested with all extension elements open and filled unless the CSU has an effective interlock system. The CSU is tested while angled to simulate the effective carpet. The main difference in configuration from the NPR is the use of the 0.3 inch, 0.43 inch block to create the angle. Next slide, please. The requirements include a single stability test, which is used to determine the tip over moment or force required to tip the CSU. As discussed earlier, to address comments on repeatability, these requirements differ from what was in the NPR in two key ways. First is that the force application method is now specified based on the design of the unit, so there is no overlap between the two methods. The second is that the requirements specify to use weights to apply the vertical force. Testers calculate the tip over moment by multiplying the force required to tip the CSU by the horizontal distance to the fulcrum for test method one and by the vertical distance to the fulcrum for test method two. Next slide, please. The tip over moment is compared to the threshold moment, which is the greatest of three applicable moments. The moments are based on the forces from a child's climbing CSU extendable element, hanging on a door, and pulling on the CSU. The moments account for the effect of extendable element and drug extension, the height of the unit, and the forces from these interactions. There are no significant changes to these moments from what was in the NPR. Next slide, please. The draft final rule has requirements for placement, content, symbols, format, and permanency for the warning label. As discussed earlier, the warning label includes a different child timing symbol from that in the NPR requirements, which is shown in the examples on the right. There are also requirements for identification information on the CSU, which have been revised from the NPR to clarify that a mark or label is acceptable. Next slide, please. The draft final rule also has requirements for a hang tag with performance and technical information. An example is shown at the bottom of the slide. As discussed earlier, the hang tag scale has changed from that in the NPR, and there are additional requirements for display at online points of sale. Next slide, please.
Sorry, next slide. Staff estimates that 83.9% non-fatal CSU took over instance involving children are addressable with the final rule. Staff estimates that the annual societal benefits from the final rule will be approximately $307 million, which includes over $41 million in reduced deaths and over $265 million in reduced injuries. Staff estimates that the total annual cost of the final rule would be around $251 million. Next slide, please. Staff examined five less stringent alternatives to the draft final rule. These are no regulatory action, require performance and technical data, but not a minimum stability, mandate ASTM F2057-19, but with a 60-pound best weight, wait for a potential update to ASTM F2057, and an effective date longer than the 180 days in the draft final rule. Staff did not recommend any of these less stringent alternatives because they would not likely reduce deaths and injuries from CSU tip overs to nearly the same extent as the draft final rule, and they would generate lower net benefits for society. Staff examined one more stringent alternative, which was to adopt a more rigorous performance standard, like the one in the draft final rule, based on the interaction forces from a 60 pound child instead of a 51.2 pound child. Staff did not recommend this alternative because it would likely only increase the benefits slightly, while it might increase the cost of it implementation disproportionately. Next slide, please. Staff determined that the draft final rule could have significant adverse impact on some small manufacturers or importers of CSU. To reduce impact, staff examined possible alternatives to the draft final rule that could reduce the expected impact on, of the rule on small businesses. However, staff's assessment of these alternatives found that their adoption would not result in a rule that adequately addresses the risk of serious injury or death caused by CSU tipovers. Next slide, please. In conclusion, child interactions, including climbing and pulling, opening multiple drawers, filled drawers, and carpet, are present in many CSU tipover incidents and contribute to instability. It is important to consider the effects of these factors simultaneously. Children ages one, two, and three years old are the most at risk for death and severe injury from CSU tipovers. The current voluntary standards for CSU stability do not adequately reduce the risk of injury associated with tipovers. Next slide, please. Staff recommends that the Commission publish a final rule for CSU that includes specific requirements on stability, marking and labeling, and hang tags. Technical analysis shows that the recommended requirements will reduce CSU deaths and injuries by reducing the occurrence of CSU tipovers. Staff recommends that the Commission propose an effective date of 180 days after publication of the final rule for manufacturers to comply with the stability requirements and include an anti stockpiling provision. Staff also recommends publishing an NOR for children's products. Next slide, please. That concludes the presentation, and we're happy to answer any questions from the Commission. Thank you for the presentation. Thanks to uh, you and uh, the rest of staff for what is a comprehensive uh, proposal. Now it's time to turn to questions from the commissioners and recognize myself for 10 minutes. So, as you noted, there are ongoing efforts to update the existing ASTM standard. While there's no final proposal or no up, final update, uh, can you expand on how the current version of what's been proposed differs from the performance standards proposed in the final uh, draft final rule? Sure, thank you for the question. The validated changes to the ASTM standards still don't address the real world scenarios. We've seen incidents that include children interacting with CSUs with multiple open and filled drawers and CSUs on carpet, and we've seen these factors occur simultaneously. The draft final rule accounts for these factors simultaneously in a single test, whereas the validated changes to the ASTM standards look at them separately. For example, the test of 60 pounds in the validated ASTM standards doesn't include filled drawers, and the test of filled drawers doesn't include the effect of carpet or child's interaction. In addition, the changes that ASTM validated don't account for the moments in children's interaction. Research has shown that children can exert moments while climbing that are over 1.6 times those from their body weight alone. So a 51.2 pound child, like we use in the draft final rule, can exert tipping forces equivalent to over 80 pounds static weight on the drawer front. Uh, ASTM also doesn't use a sufficient pull force. The draft final rule uses 17.2 pounds 
pull for us, which is based on existing child strength data, whereas the uh, potential ballot of the ASPM standard only uses the 10 pound pull for us. Thank you. As you mentioned, it's balloted, but it's not final. So, so we don't really know what the final, what a final updated standard would look like. Is that correct? That's correct. And you mentioned in your presentation about uh, tip over uh, moment. And can you explain a little bit more about uh, what that is and why the final rule uses a tip over moment instead of a set weight, like is in the past team standard? Sure. So, a tip over moment is the rotational force that will cause the CSU to tip over. Past the stability test requirements in the draft final rule, the tip over moment of a specific CSU has to exceed three calculated comparison moments. And those represent the moments associated with the child interacting with the CSU, including climbing on the CSU, climbing or hanging on a CSU door, and pulling on a CSU. Those moments are key to whether the CSU tips over. For a child ascending a CSU, the tip over moment calculation specified in the rule accounts for the child's center of gravity extending about six inches beyond the CSU extension and the dynamic forces created by a child climbing up the open extendable element. For a child pulling on a CSU, the moment accounts for the height of the pull. The use of moments also accounts for the effect of different geometric features of the specific CSU, such as spur extension, the location of the feet, uh, CSU height, uh, all those factors impact stability during child interaction. By contrast, a way with a set value at the end of a drawer doesn't account for the moments from a child interacting with the specific CSU. Thank you. And one other thing I just wanted to highlight, I was pleased to see that in the proposed final rule, there was um, requirements for an online name tag. Uh, function. It's been a priority for me to, from my perspective to make sure that consumers are going online. Uh, they're not facing more hazards than they would see in a brick and mortar store. Can you explain a little bit more about the, um, the online sales, uh, the requirements on, from the online perspective and basis for that? Sure. So, the purpose of the hang tag is to help consumers in evaluating the comparative safety of products when making buying decisions at the time of purchase and to protect the public from unreasonable risks of injuries. Because consumers often buy CSUs online, this is an important point at which to provide that comparative safety information, in addition to physical points of sale. Uh, multiple commenters recommend online hang tags for the same reason. The content in the format of the hang tag is the same for physical and online hang tags, and the online provisions aim to ensure visibility on the sales website similar to what you would have with physical handbags. Thank you. Thank you for all your work on this. I'm going to turn to my fellow commissioners at this point in time. Uh, Commissioner Feldman, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, thank you both for the, the presentation today. Uh, I guess this, this uh, question is directed at, at both of you, but I, I did have some questions about uh, the anti-stockpiling provision that's included in, uh, in, in the draft final rule. Uh, and specifically how that would be uh, in, enforced. Uh, so, uh, as we've done in, in other rules, this talks about uh, 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 basing the anti-stockpiling limits on uh, median numbers uh, across 13 months. And how, how would that apply to firms that import maybe only one or two months a, a, a year? Would the, the median number be based solely on um, the months that they're importing, or or it would still extend over, over thirteen. Good afternoon. Um, um, my name is Alex Moscoso. I'm the associate executive director for economic analysis, and I can uh, answer your question, uh, Commissioner. Um, so the the as as is written, the median would be just the median of the preceding thirteen months. Um, so it, it will it would be as currently written. Uh, just the the middle number there. Um, we uh, previously uh, we did put it out for comment. Uh, we received generally supportive comments uh, about it from the from the public comments. Um, so uh, we we kept it as is uh, when it was amended in the NPR. Okay. Would it apply uh, to firms on a skew by skew basis? 
um, that you we would be calculating uh, the 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 anti stockpiling limits based on individual SKUs, or would it be uh, across sort of the entire selection that might be imported across that thirteen month period? So, so I uh, my understanding is that it's, it's applied to the in scope CSUs sales. Um, and, and based off their historical sales in the preceding 13 months on, on the in scope products on the in scope products. Um, but uh, again, the median number would be uh, a, a median of. All of the in scope products that an individual firm might be importing or manufacturing or. Uh, you know, ba based on the individual in scope. I'm just I'm curious what the denominator sure. is. So it would the the the, the median month of within the 13 months of sales and then I believe it's 105% level above that median month. Okay, but based on individual skewed products or uh, across all of the potential in scope products that as written all models would be included. Okay. Um and and uh, thank you. And uh there are, as I understand the industry, uh, there are, uh, and, and as I understand how, how, how the, the rules currently drafted right now, um, it, it matters whether you are a manufacturer or an importer. And as I understand this industry, uh, there are a number of uh, of entities that that occupy both positions right now. Um, you know, what about firms that are both manufacturer that may be manufacturing abroad? And importing, uh, does that create a, a situation where the company might be able to double dip um, or choose sort of the most preferable uh, uh, limit uh, against which to, to to figure out what, what their anti-stockpiling limit would be? So, um, Commissioner, I, I can't really say on a case by case basis. I think that's um, that would that would be determined on a case by case basis. But, but as written, um, it applies again to the to the median month, um, and it, it applies on all models, manufacturers and importers of clothing storage units. Uh, I'm trying to sorry, I'm reading it. Shall not import clothing storage units that do not comply with requirements. Uh, right. But what, what I'm month. asking is, what happens when you're the manufacturer and the importer? Um, it applies to both. So, um, again, on, on a case by case basis, um, I can't, I can't say on, on a case by case basis, but as I written, it applies to both importers and manufacturers. Um, how that works out, um, I think, uh, again, it would be a case by case basis. Like, I, I really can't say. Um, okay, um, maybe this is a, yep, yeah, please go ahead. Yes, this is Dwayne Brown. Yeah, my apologies about that uh, echo. So the uh, the uh, draft final rule, as written, applies uh, in aggregate for the manufacturer and import. Uh, so it doesn't really specify any kind of breakout uh, between the uh, importers. Uh, or the uh, uh, the models imported or manufactured. Okay, okay, that's I appreciate that that uh, that that answers my question. Uh, lastly, um, the, the the draft final rule references built-in units, and it's my understanding that, uh, that that previously we had offered some clarity about about what we meant by built-ins. Um, as I'm reading through the the, the draft final rule, um, I'm not seeing that as a defined term. Um, but I was I was hoping uh, your staff could discuss and provide some color on sort of common characteristics of built in units uh, so that we get a better sense of sort of exactly what it is that we're talking about here. Sure. So the definition of freestanding in the draft final rule is that the unit remains upright without needing attachment to the wall or up their upright for the structure when it's fully assembled and empty with all expendable elements and doors closed, and built-in units are not considered freestanding. The NPR and the draft final rule both explain that CSUs need to be inherently stable rather than rely on tip restraints because of various reasons tip restraints may not be used, installed properly, or be effective. 
Um, the NPR and draft pound rule also notes that how a manufacturer intends a product to be used or installed, for example, with zipper strains, is not determinative of whether it is a CSU, because consumers will use products that function as CSUs as CSUs regardless of marketing or manufacturing intent. Um, right. So as such, tip restraints and similar features would not make a unit freestanding. Uh, I can't comment on specific products, but built-in units are generally those that are built into the house. So like a dresser that's integrated into a wall nook, and they aren't generally something that can be easily removed or relocated. Okay. I appreciate that answer. Thank you very much. I have no further questions at this time, but I appreciate the presentation. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Trumpka. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you to everybody who worked on this rule and who worked on this final briefing package and the presentation today. Uh, you delivered the rule that we needed to protect kids from unstable dressers, tipping over and killing them or sending them to the hospital. Um, it solves a problem that the furniture industry has known about for decades, one that we entrusted them to solve. And with the problem so fundamental, you know, why not trust that they would be able to solve it? But unfortunately here, the public's trust was misplaced. And for 24 years, industry went through the motions of multiple drafts of voluntary standards while failing to ever adequately address the problem. And so this agency stepped up and the people who worked on this stepped up and, and are working to solve this once and for all right now. And I'm incredibly happy with the rule that we put forward. I only have a few questions about it. Um, I think the first thing you mentioned in your presentation already that the current voluntary standard does not adequately protect children from tip overs and, and staff went even farther and analyzed the proposed rule that, that hasn't been adopted yet. And also found that that failed to adequately protect kids from tip overs. Is that right? That's correct. We analyzed the um, the potential changes to the standards that have been valid so far. Yeah, that that is the type of of uh, above and beyond work that it is much appreciated here. And and again, it, it points out that that problem that that standard will not protect kids adequately, but this rule will, and and it will protect significantly more kids from that risk of tip over, which is really encouraging to see. Um, I guess. I pulled out my book because uh, Commissioner Spellman's last question prompted uh, uh, a follow up for me on that. On page 382, the, the bolded numbers at the top of the briefing package, it, we, we go through the staff's changes between the NPR and the final rule. And there's one that we had an example of units that are intended to be permanently installed. And, and we say that that was like kitchen cabinets and bathroom vanities. And that was deleted from the NPR into the final rule. Is there a reason that we got rid of the examples? So the reason for the modification to the definition of freestanding for public comments, um, we specifically received comments um, that people were kind of confused by the definition that we had provided in the NPR. Um, specifically, those examples that were provided of built-in units um, weren't something that would specifically be considered a CSU um, anyhow. Um, of course, the, based on the design, you'd have to still look at whether it met the definition. So that's why we removed those examples within the definition. Okay. Uh, and, and I'm glad that we got, uh, uh, Dwayne, thank you for stepping in and helping to explain the, um, the stockpiling uh, amendment there. So the fact that we have, it seems like that one's resolved. It, 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 it matches the definition of imported or manufactured. It borrows that from the previous iteration of stockpiling that we used. We just redefined base period and the stockpiling amount. So I don't think we present any new issues and certainly the commenters agreed with that sentiment by uh, supporting it. Um, so, so good to hear that that one seems resolved. I, I wanted to turn briefly to our analysis of the benefits and the costs of the rule. Uh, and, and one thing that jumped out at me is that there's an estimate that 20.64 million CSUs were sold in 2021. And so that's about 5.16 million dressers sold every three months. And there's also an assumption that the dressers stay in homes for 15 years on average. And, and my thought here is if we decided to move the effective date, we had 30 days in the rule, we're proposing 180, day, but, uh, 180 days here. If we move that effective date to something like 90 days, that would prevent over 5 million non-compliant dressers from entering homes and staying there for 15 years. And I think it's fair to say that the benefit of that speed in terms of presenting, preventing injuries and deaths from those additional dangerous dressers would be substantial. 
And so when we think about the effective date of the rule, I, I, I think we should consider that benefit. And on the cost side, there were several comments that mentioned disruptions uh, to supply chain under various effective dates. And we certainly have to consider those too. And assuming those comments are accurate, shortening the effective date could mean that we that some unstable dressers would be unavailable for a few months sooner while companies work towards selling compliant dressers. And, and so we've got a tough call. And we don't quantify in this package, we don't quantify the trade-off between those particular costs and benefits, but we talk about them qualitatively. And I think that's probably the best we can really do here. Um, so I'm struggling with how we weigh that trade-off. And, and my question is, would you agree that determining that right trade-off is ultimately going to have to be a policy decision that we make as a commission? Commissioner, uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, yes, it, it is a trade-off, um, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a decision for the commission. I, I would just add, um, you know, as you mentioned, the comments um, uh, had significant concerns uh, with meeting with the with the 30 day effective date being feasible, you're, you're uh, offering a 90 days as, as an example here, but uh, in the comments, they stated that they would, the manufacturers and retailers would need 180 days uh, to be compliant with the rule. Some stated as high as 360 days. Um, staff's assessment was 180 days would be, um, which is the highest range um, uh, allowed in the CPSA or, or available. Um, that that would be uh, an asset that that would have manufacturers give manufacturers enough time to to be compliant. Um, also, I, I do want to state that you mentioned the benefits of the rules about an earlier effective date, and you know to put a finer point on it, it's about the expected gross benefits per compliant CSU is twelve to twenty dollars. So, in other words, each compliant CSU that replaces a non-compliant CSU avoids societal costs from debts and injuries. Of about 12 to 20 dollars over the 15 year product life. And so a shorter effective date would bring those benefits sooner. Only if the manufacturers and suppliers are able to bring those compliance CSUs under that timeline. But, uh, you know, staff doesn't know the, those benefits are only realized if they're available and the and the. Uh, the assessment was that the, the risk. Of shortages and supplies uh, was credible given. The examples provided by the commenters and what how it comports so we understand about the supply uh, about the supply chain. Well, I, I appreciate that, and I, I, I was that, hearing uh, that uh, you were going to agree with me that this fell on the commission's shoulders to decide the right path forward here, because I think it is a tough call. Um, you know, I, I think the one thing I would mention. Sorry, I'm getting feedback. Any any better? All right, better. All right. If everybody no, but, so sure Trump can mute, I appreciate it. Thank you. And, and I think that that took care of it. I appreciate that. And, and I think, you know, the, the one thing I would say there is, yes, I do appreciate you pointing out the 12 to $20 savings. If we swap a, uh, a more stable dresser for an existing dresser. Um, but the other benefit that I'm talking about there is not putting more unstable dressers in, co in commerce. And that 90 days means that 5.14 million unstable dressers never end up in commerce and in people's homes. And I think that's a benefit that we, we can only really qualitatively evaluate. And so that's the one I'll be thinking about right now. Um, I appreciate the feedback. I appreciate the, the work that, that everyone's done on this. And I think the result is exemplary. Um, this is a great rule and I'm very happy that we are where we are in it right now. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I recognize Commissioner Boyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, Dr. Talcott and Ms. Kelsch for the presentation and for all the work over these many months and these many years. And it really shows, and I appreciate it very much. Just have a couple of questions. Um, I do want to ask a, a couple of data questions, if you don't mind. Um, I think in the package it says that uh, other than 2010, there were three um, tip over fatalities involving children every year for the period that you looked at. Um, except that in 2021, uh, for which the data is not yet complete, there were five uh, fatalities that you've identified. And I'm just wondering, um, given that I think the trend lines are actually dipping down, why, what would account for that spike um, in that most recent year, if you know? Sure. So the number of reported fatalities are anecdotal in nature. 
and they provide a minimum count for the number of incidents that have occurred. Uh, no trend analysis can be done on the anecdotal reporting, and we can't make a causal relationship determination based on higher or lower volume reporting of fatal and non-fatal incidents. On the other hand, the NICE data are probability and sample base and specifically used for the purpose of generating national estimates and trends. However, in the draft final rule briefing package, staff cautions that estimated of injuries treated is in emergency departments were likely reduced by the COVID-19 pandemic for the years 2020 and 2021. So it's a little bit difficult to draw conclusions from that data right now. All right, but it's ongoing. I think I have one thing. Okay, thank you. Um, I also wanted to ask about seniors. Um, it says uh, that there were 24 reported fatality uh, involving seniors, and I just wanted to ask about the hazard patterns involved with seniors and the type of injuries that you saw. And, and then finally, um, how the rule might uh, it does address those hazard patterns. So with regards to the hazard patterns for seniors, uh, in the fatal incidents, the ages of victims as well as some of the incident narratives support the assumption that the victims were likely losing their balance and reaching for the CSUs to balance themselves. Uh, among the non-fatal CPS RMS took over incidents involving adults, which includes seniors, uh, the reported interactions included opening and getting items from drawers, pushing down, leaning, or falling on the CSU, uh, in addition to pulling on the CSU. So even though we focus our analysis and our requirements on the hazards of children, uh, we still conclude that improving the stability of CSU should reduce a substantial proportion of the non-fatal incidents and fatal incidents involving adults, including seniors. Uh, assuming that the interactions in the non-fatal incidents with adults are similar to the interactions in the fatal incidents. And that's because the majority of the incidents involve adults interacting with the CSU with the same kind of interactions that we're seeing, um, opening drawers, getting items in and out of drawers, leaning on the CSU. And those are all scenarios that are expected to be less or equally severe compared to the incidence of children climbing with the drawers filled and open. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and for adults and seniors, was there a gender differential that you could see in the data? So we don't have a gender breakdown of injuries to seniors in the NPR or the draft final rule. So unfortunately, I can't answer that question at this time. Okay, because I just was looking at the 2022 to go report, uh, and it looks like it's 50-50 in terms of uh, males and females. But that if you, and tell me if I'm reading this data incorrectly, please. But it looks like for um, children, the overwhelming number of incidents and fatalities involve males, uh, but for adults and seniors, the trend is reversed and the majority involve females. Is that an accurate um, characterization of that data? So I can't really comment on the annual tip-over report. Um, that's a CPSC document describing per incidents for a variety of projects. And that includes CSUs, um, generally under the chest, bureau, stressors, borders, and armor categories. Um, but it also includes other non-CSU products like shelving units and tables. Um, so while there is overlap, the data set in the annual TIPO report is different from that in the NPR and draft final rule, um, including differences in products and the reported time frame. Um, I will say that neither the CSU, NPR, or draft final rule includes breakdown of incidents by gender, um, but we do use the heavier of the male and female weights and the higher strength values for the requirements in order to ensure an appropriate coverage of, of the rule for both genders. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, just moving on from that, I just wanted to ask a little bit about warning labels and the decision to um, if the component is raised. Um, uh, whether we should have warning labels in multiple languages and other that's if that's possible, and just if you could explain that, you know, uh, I got the decision not to proceed. Sure. So, um, the NPR and the draft panel rules do specify an English language um, label. Staff assess that adding additional content or language to the same label could detract from the effectiveness of the label by overloading consumers with information or reducing visibility and comprehension. Um, however, that doesn't prevent manufacturers from providing additional separate labels, including labels in Spanish. And it's already fairly common for manufacturers selling to the North American market to include labels in English, French, and Spanish. 
The labels also include graphical symbols, including the child climbing symbol. They're designed to communicate information without text. Um, do we have any data on um, uh, uh, where incidents occur in terms of the households that are not English speaking? Do we have a breakdown in that, in that way? We don't have information on that. Um, uh, another uh, data question um, in terms of the secondhand market. Do we have a sense um, uh, of what the secondhand market for these type of products is that they can bring to the secondhand market? Uh, and have other possible ways to provide um, information uh, that is sort of more of a permanent nature so that the second gen market users would have the information in that would be able to say from the internet. So I don't have information on the percentage of the CSC market that's secondhand goods at this time, um, but there are permanency requirements for the warning label and identification marker label in the draft final rule. Those permanency requirements are from the ASTM standards, and we've assessed that they're adequate. Um, therefore, the information from those labels should be available to consumers who purchase their PSEs secondhand. Okay, just one last question on the hang tag. Uh, is there um, at this time any sense of how we would be evaluating the efficacy of the, the rating system and then going forward uh, for consumers? Sorry, I missed the last part of that question. Just, just in terms of the hang tag, looking forward, how will we be evaluating uh, how effective that, um, you know, it's not something we uh, have done all that frequently. And so I'm just wondering if at this time it may be premature whether staff is thinking how that will be evaluating the efficacy of the hang tag. So um, there's some evidence from car purchasing decisions that the second highest reason provided for not purchasing a particular car is because consumers thought that a car is not as safe as other models. Uh, that's indicating that consumers evaluate similar models and consider the comparative safety information in their car purchasing decisions. And we expect to see a similar outcome in TSU purchase. This, in addition to a steady increase in stability rating scores, um, similar to what NHTSA observed after they implemented their rating system. Uh, we plan to monitor the incident data to determine if there's a decline in incidents, and if there is, part of that decline may be attributable to consumers making an informed choice in purchasing more stable units. Although it's not possible to individually affect, uh, individually assess the effect of hang tags on the reduction of incidents. Thank you very much again, Dr. Talcott, for this excellent work and for the presentation today. Uh, I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, this point in time, um, I don't think anybody went over their 10 minutes. Um, I'd ask if anybody is asking for a second round in the open session. Hearing none, um, then I, I thank the staff for this uh, informative briefing and for the commissioners for the active participation. As noted at the beginning, we have had a request for a closed session to follow this session. So, commissioners and staff, please uh, immediately reconvene the closed portion of this briefing. Um, there was an email that was sent during the briefing with the information in it. So, at this point in time, I'm going to close this part of the briefing. Thanks.